God bless you and welcome to our New Believers Foundational Study. We're basically just barely getting ready. Uh, this will be our chapter three. We've done chapter one and chapter two. Very basic for new believers and our attempt, our goal is to begin to build foundation in believers so we can stand in these last days, these days of shaking and uh, the whole world being shaken. We have to have foundation built in us to be strong in the Lord. So today I'm going to be talking about the work of Christ. That is our, <clears throat> excuse me, that is going to be, that is our title actually. So chapter 3, New Be Beginners Class, The Work of Christ. Um, many have heard about the last events of Jesus, as his sin, sinless life on the earth. He was condemned as a common crim criminal. He hung on a cross until he died, and then three days later, he rose again from the dead. We're going to go over this today. Few people understand the meaning of these events, so we're going to go over it. And some of you are well aware that Jesus gave his life on the cross, and he died, and he rose again for our salvation. But you know what? The more that we go over it, and, and the deeper we go into the foundational classes, the more foundation we have inside, the stronger we are to be able to stand in these last days. And that is the whole goal, to be able to stand, to stand firm, to not be like a reed shaken in the wind or a, a falling or being in deception or going with every wind of doctrine, but to stay with the Bible and what the Bible says and what Jesus and the disciples taught. This is what God has left us. This is the instruction. This is the direction for our life. All that is in the Bible. Okay. Um, we're going to start with the life of Christ. We have three subtitles. The life of Christ, the death of Christ, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So in chapter 3, we're going to explore his life, his death, and his resurrection. And uh, let me st we're going to start with the, the life of Jesus. And I'll do, uh, in, during this, a brief synopsis of his whole life and ministry. And this is not a long, as usual, it's probably a 20, 20 maybe 25 to 30 minute teaching. But... If you'd like to enter in, I just really invite you to do so. Not only that, I encourage you to take notes and to be aware of um, the fact that we're not just reading these scriptures, but we're actually in a time to build foundation. That is the whole purpose, to get that foundation inside of us. Not only so we're strong, not only so we're not shaken like a reed in the wind or we're not shaken during that time of the storm, but we're on a firm foundation, not only for ourselves, but so we can teach others, so we can train others, so we can encourage others in that also. So in saying that, let's talk about Jesus a little bit, uh, about his life and about his ministry. Um, we, most of us know that 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ, he was uh, born in an obscure town of Bethlehem. And while Jesus was an infant, Joseph and Mary took him and, and they took him to Egypt to escape the um, uh, King Herod the Great, which is what he's called in the Bible. He was an irate king and he was out to kill Jesus. Well, then while uh, he was still a young child, they moved, Joseph and Mary moved to Nazareth of Galilee. We're going to look at uh, Mark 1 and verse 21. If you'd like to take notes, please note that verse down and go over it through the week. And we're going to see what purpose did the angel give for Jesus coming into the world and we need to know that and we need we do know it a lot of us know it we we have this um 
biblical idea. Yes, he came into the world, but what does the scriptural scriptures literally say? That's what we want to know. Not just an overview of what's in your mind or an assumption of what's in your mind, but actually what does the scripture say? So in Matthew 1 and 21, it says, And she will have to speak in a Mary, or 1 and 21, yes. So, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus. That was the instruction given to them from the Lord, or from the angel of the Lord. For he will save his people from their sins. So that is the exact purpose right there why Jesus came. He came to save you. He came to save me of our sins, from our sins, to cleanse us and to save us from our sins. And then in Luke 1, 31 through 33, he will be, a, be very great and he will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor, David. So Jesus will save his people from their sins. He will be very great and he will be called the Son of the Most High. So that's exactly who he is. Who the Bible says he is, is who he is. And then in Luke 2, 52, we see how Jesus, uh, as a youth, he developed. Uh, as a youth, Jesus grew, it says, in wisdom. And I'm reading out of Luke 2, uh, verse 52. He grew in wisdom and stature, in favor with God and all the people. And this is what we want to do. We want to do what Jesus did. We want to follow him. We want to be a follower of Christ. We do not want to be a follower of vain thoughts and imaginations. We do not want to be a follower of just men's thoughts and, and, and what man teaches us. But we want to know the word of God. We want to follow Jesus and be like Jesus. So uh, we've got to know the word of God in order to do that. So he grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and with all people. So he had to, had to have been taught and had to learn. And that's what we're doing right now. Amen. So, you know, I encourage you once again, take notes. Get in the word. There are not a lot of scriptures that I really give. So to get these inside of us would be a huge plus for our lives, each and every one of us. Uh, we'll talk a little, we're going to talk a little bit about the activities of Jesus in his uh, own public ministry. In Matthew 4 and 24, it says, Jesus traveled, traveled throughout the region of Galilee, teaching in the synagogues. He taught in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. So, you know, I would kind of get an idea that that's what we're supposed to do also is we're supposed to announce the good news everywhere we go, every chance we get, every door that God opens for us about the kingdom. That should be our life. It should not be our Sunday-only topic of the day. It should be our life seven days a week, 24 hours a day. And it says, let me, <laughs> I interrupted the verse Okay, he, region of, of Galilee, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. And he healed every kind of disease and illness, which is what Jesus said we would do. He says, these works that he does and greater than these will you do. So we've got to learn what he did. We've got to walk after his example. He, he has given to us instructions and examples in the Bible that's why we need to know what the Word of God says. And then in Mark 3 and 14, we learn why Jesus, uh, he selected 12 apostles. Why did he do that? The Bible clearly tells us right here in Mark 3 and 14, then he appointed 12 of them and called them his apostles. They were to accompany him. So they were to be with him in his ministry and then it says, the second part of that, and says it says, and he, so speaking of Jesus, would send them out to preach. 
So not only were they to accompany Jesus and his ministry and work in his ministry, but he was also going to send them out to preach. And, and there you go again. That's a pretty good idea of how he's going to use us. And it may not be like everybody's not going to be on a platform preaching, but you know, everywhere you're going to go. The Bible says, out of the heart, the mouth speaks. So what comes out of your heart seven days a week is what's in your heart. That's what's going to come out. Amen? So we want the good things of the gospel, of the good news of Jesus Christ and the kingdom to be coming out of our mouth. Then we need to know it. We learn that servanthood is, is characterized, is what characterized Jesus' leadership. Servanthood. And that doesn't appeal to too many people. You know, it's not like you got your name in lights and you're Mr. Popular or Mrs. Popular or whatever. You are, but you're going to be characterized as servanthood if you're going to be like Jesus, because that was Jesus. Um, and he was a leader. So, hey, hey, leaders, let's humble ourselves and become servants. Servants to the people, servants to the Most High, our Lord, our God, our Father. Okay, going to Luke 2, 25 through 27. But among you it will be different. Those who are the greatest among you should take the lowest rank. And the leader should be like a servant. How many times do we see that today? Not too often. Who is more important, the one who sits at the table or the one who serves? Now, this is what the Bible says. This is what Luke 22, 25 through 27 says. Then one who sits at the table, the one who sits at the table, of course. But not here, Jesus said, not here, for I'm among you as one who serves. So that's what Jesus' attitude was, and that's what our attitude should be. I am one here among you who serves. We can follow his example just by becoming a servant or having a servant's heart, uh, being willing to be the lowest rank, not, not having to be up there out front and on top all the time, but having that servant heart, uh, accepting that lowest rank and not the highest. And there will be times, you know, you may receive the highest rank, all oh, fine and good. But, you know, either way or wherever God wants to place you is the ultimate place that you or I need to be. Um, and actually, this boils down to a, a whole lot of humility to have the attitude like that, to be the servant, to have the servant's heart, to... Uh, to not want to be the highest rank, but to receive the lowest rank, that's humility. And and not just doing it like uh, it's a drudgery, but doing it with a good attitude, receiving from God where he has put you, and being thankful in that place, because he has a good plan for you. So, okay, once again, today we're only touching on the events of Jesus' life, and I'm going to read to you some of the events of his life at the very end, at the end of the Gospel of John. This is amazing right here. Let's look at John 21, 25. It says, at the end of the Gospel of John, we read this. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written in regard to what Jesus did in his life. Now, that's what the Bible tells us. That's huge. The whole world could not contain the books of the things that Jesus did in three years. And you know, some of us have been around for 20, 30, 50, 40, how many ever years. And what have we done? Look at your life. What have you done? And that's not to put anybody down. It's a comparison. We need, we need to look at our example, which was Jesus, and look at our own lives. And then, you know what, we need to ask God to examine us. Like we went over the scripture last week. Search me and know me. See if there be any wicked way in me. We need to keep that our prayer and humble ourselves 
before him and request of him as we look at his life and we look at our life, request of him, Lord, you know what, where do you want me today? What do you want me to do today? And as we go before him, as we seek him daily, we should be inquiring, what does he want? What is on his heart? Not what's on your heart. You know, lay that down. Lay that down. Does he want us to have the desires of our hearts? I, I believe he does. But I also believe he's got the best plan for us, probably better than any plan that we could think of for ourselves. Okay, so I'm going to read off some of the familiar events of Jesus' life. And, and as we go, on, on these lessons have been really shallow. But you know what? We're going to go deeper into Scripture, and we're going to take it a little bit at a time. We're building upon building upon building foundation. And we've got to have that in order to stand. And, uh... Okay. Did I lose my page? No. All right. So in Matthew 6, 21, we read what Jesus predicted would happen to him. Um... Let me go ahead and read that. Go with me there to Matthew 16 and 21. It says, From then on, Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem and that he would suffer many terrible things at the hands of the elders. The elders, he's talking about church people, the leading priests, and the teachers of religious law. He would be killed, but on the third day, he would be raised from the dead. So, you know, as we look at that and, and just think about if you were one of those disciples standing there listening to this, it would almost probably be unbelievable to think he would say such a thing that the church people were going to do this to Jesus, the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. But Jesus told them himself, I can just imagine the, the shock or maybe even the disbelief that they must have felt. Let's go ahead and look at the death that Jesus suffered in Matthew 27, 35. It says, After they had nailed him to the cross, the soldiers gambled for his clothes by throwing dice. And then a couple verses down, it tells us that Jesus um, was crucified between two revolutionaries. Or let me start over the, the verse. Two revolutionaries were crucified with him, one on his right side and one on his left. That's Matthew 27, 38. And I'll say here, since we're talking about this, the thief on the cross that gave his life to Christ, that said all, all he said, he did not say the sinner's prayer word for word. He did not say all that, but God knew his innermost thoughts in his heart. And in his heart, he was repentant and he was sorry. And uh, he said, Lord, remember me today, or today, remember me. I don't even know if he said today, but anyway, he said, Lord, remember me. And Jesus knew his heart, and he looked at him, and he said, today, today you will be with me in paradise. And so that man became born again right there on his deathbed, so to speak. He was... Um, being crucified right there with Jesus. Okay, now here I am going to take a moment on the overview of the life of Christ. And I'm going to bring out some points um, that we'll be talking about his developing years, his carpenter years, his public ministry, his years including from his birth to Bethlehem, flight to Egypt, and move to Galilee. Um in his developing years was his he was his visit to the temple. And I, I don't know how far you, some of you have read into that, but anyway, his visit to the temple, his discussion, and we will be going over these as we go in chapters to come yet. With his discussion with rabbis and then three years of public ministry, he was baptized by John. 
He was tempted in the wilderness, and the first miracle was he turned water into wine. First Passover, he cast out the uh, money changers, and there was a woman at the well that wanted water. And then there was the second Passover, and then there was the choosing of the twelve, the Sermon on the Mount, the parable of the sower, the gathering, demoniac healed, twelve apostles commissioned. It was the feeding of 5,000. These are just highlights, okay, which we'll get into some of it more later. But this was his ministry. And Jesus walks on the water, his transfiguration. Uh, Seventy were sent out on evangelism. He raised Lazarus from the dead. And then the last week of his life was uh, his arrival to Jerusalem, his final days there of ministry, he was crucified and risen. His arrival to Jerusalem was a triumphant entry into Jerusalem, if you remember, on Good Friday. And then a casting out of money changers out of the temple. His final days, remember him calling the temple, this is my father's house, a house of prayer. Um, his final days of ministry were the, his great commandment of love, signs of coming events, plots of the Jews and Judas, the Passover meal, washing the disciples' feet. And we don't see or hear much about that anymore, but it's very much part of the Bible. And then the Lord's Supper and, um, inter, let's see, intercessory prayer, the betrayal, and then he was crucified. So the trials before the high priest, the council, the religious folks, the uh, Pilate before Pilate, the, his death, crucifixion, and burial. And then he was risen. So his resurrection, he appeared to the disciples, and then he appeared to 500, the ascension. Jesus went to the cross voluntarily. And we're going to read that in John 10, 17, and 18. He said, No one can take my life from me. I sacrifice it voluntarily, for I have the authority to lay it down when I want to, and also to take it up again, for this is what my Father has commanded. So no one took Jesus' life from him. He voluntarily laid down his life for you and I. Excuse me. Okay. So let's like take a look at man's condition apart from Christ. John 3, 18. There is no judgment against anyone who believes in him. But anyone who does not believe in him, speaking of Jesus, has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only Son. So you've already been judged, you're already condemned before you ever come to the knowledge of Christ and believe in him as being born again. You're under condemnation and... Um, let's look at 1 Peter 3 and 18 and see why Jesus what Jesus did to bring condemned men to God. It, the Bible says, Scripture says, Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. He suffered physical death, but he was raised to life in the Spirit. So there's absolutely nothing that can be added to Christ's death to make us more acceptable to God because Jesus did it all at, the, at Calvary's cross. So it's already been done, and we're, we're going to look at, what, at that in Hebrews 10, verses 12 through 14. Very powerful, important verse to, to hold on to, to know, to get it in us. It says, but our high priest offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sins. Good for all time. Then he sat down in the place of honor at God's right hand. There he waits until his enemies are humbled and made a footstool under his feet. So, 
So God, a single sacrifice for sin, good for all time. Then he sat down in the place of honor at God's right hand, and then he waits until his enemies are humbled and made a footstool under his feet. So this is our starting point into eternity. When we give God our life, when we humble ourselves before him and receive Christ into our life, we come out of darkness into his marvelous light, and so much more, actually, that we'll take it a step at a time. So we need to praise God. We're going to we're going to be looking at the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He was raised from the dead for you and I. And this isn't a story. It's not a fairy tale. This is the truth. You can search out history. The tomb was empty. In Matthew 27, 62 through 66, we're going to see what was done to secure his tomb after he died. They told him this. Sir, we remember what what that deceiver once said while he was still alive. After three days, I will rise from the dead. Now they're talking about Jesus. So we request that you seal the tomb because of what Jesus said to them. And they had recalled it. We request that you seal the tomb until the third day. This will prevent his disciples from coming and stealing his body and then telling everyone that he was raised from the dead. If that happens, we'll be worse off than we were at first. So this is the plots and plans going on behind the scenes because they had recalled what Jesus said about being raised from the dead. Now, Jesus had already prophesied it. It was surely going to happen. But they wanted to stop that from happening. So they sealed the tomb and they, they posted guards around it to protect it. Then in Matthew 28, 1 through 7, we're going to see what was discovered at the tomb when on the first day of the week after his death and his burial. It says, early on Sunday morning, as, as the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and, her, and the other Mary went out to visit the tomb. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and he rolled aside the stone, and he sat on it. So the guards shook with fear when they saw him, and they fell into a dead faint. Then the angel spoke to the women that had come to the tomb, and he said, Don't be afraid. He said, I know you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He isn't there. He is risen from the dead, just as he said would happen. Come and see where his body was lying. So the angel showed them in the tomb there where Jesus' body had been. And now go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And he is, gonna he and he is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there. Remember what I have told you. Now I'm sure this they were all probably in some kind of shock. Go and, and quickly tell the disciples uh, that he is risen from the dead and he's going ahead of you to Galilee. And you're going to see him there. Now, I imagine that was pretty shocking. And uh, maybe some of them weren't even knowing what to think. But he, the angel told them, remember what I've told you. So... So we need to hear what the angel said about Jesus. He said, don't be afraid. I know you're looking for Jesus, but he isn't here. He's risen from the dead, just as he said would happen. So, so everyone has already been told that he would be risen. And then in Matthew 28, uh, the soldiers are bribed. Let's go to there. Let's go there. Matthew 28, 11 through 15. As the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city, told the leading priest what had happened. A meeting with the elders was called, and they decided to give the soldiers a large bribe. And they told the soldiers, you must say, Jesus' disciples came during the night while we were sleeping, and they stole his body. So here they were being bribed to lie 
When the guards accepted the bribe and said that they were told to say, said what they were told to say, their story spread widely among the Jews, and they still tell it today. But it was a lie. And then in Luke 24, uh, verse 36, let's look at the first impression after his resurrection. When Jesus appeared to his disciples, and, and just as they were uh, telling about it, Jesus himself was suddenly standing right there among them. Peace be with you, he said. First thing he said to them, peace be with you. But the whole group was startled and frightened, thinking they were seeing a ghost or something. And Jesus knew that, of course, in uh, Luke 24, 39 through 43, he says, and this is what Jesus did to show them he had a body. Look at my hands, he said. Look at my feet. You can see that it's really me. Touch me and make sure that I am not a ghost. He knew what they were thinking. He said, because ghosts don't have bodies, as you see that I do. And as he spoke, he showed them his hands, and he showed them his feet. And still they stood there in disbelief, filled with joy and, and filled with wonder. And then he asked them, do you have anything to eat? And he ate. He ate it as they watched him. They gave him some fish, actually. So in looking at the whole package and closing this chapter here, looking at the whole package of the gospel or the essence of the gospel message, let's look at 1 Corinthians 15, 1 and 5. And I do want to make a point here. Um, as I said earlier, when we accept Christ, that is our starting point. When we begin to learn and grow, that is where we start in eternity. So in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 5, it says, Let me remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news I preached to you before. You welcomed it then, and you still stand firm in it. It is the good news that saves you if you continue to believe the message. Now, I want you to note that part of the verse right there. It is the good news that saves you. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is everything that Jesus did for us. But he goes on to say that it, that saves us if you continue to believe the message. You know, uh, I'll go ahead and finish this. It says, I told you, unless, of course, you believe something else that was never true in the first place. I passed on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins just as the scripture said he did. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day just as the scripture said. He was seen by Peter and then by the twelve. And I'll run down or and close in remembering some of the points from this session. But I want you to think about this. If you continue to believe the message. So there the many times in the scripture you'll notice as we read. The Bible will say, if you do this, I will do this. So many times there are conditions to what we choose to do in regard to what God is going to do. Sometimes those conditions could even be uh, bringing judgment upon us if, if we're going to walk in disobedience, if we're going to do the things he told us not to do. Are we saved by works? No. But you know what? Without works, our, our faith is dead. So in, if you're serving God, you are going to have things that you do that show you are a servant of God. And if you're doing other things than that, it's going to show that you're a servant of someone else. That maybe you have not continued in the way. That you've taken yourself out of the hands of God and went another way. And I guarantee you, as we read the Bible, you'll see where many did. Uh, many followed Jesus for a while. And then they turned and they went another way. And we have, or we have those, like say the seed and the sower. There's a scripture where it says uh, some seed 
It fell on shallow ground and then the enemy came and stole that seed and then some fell away or persecution came and they fell away. Why? Because they didn't have depth in them. They didn't have what we're trying to build in young people or new believers today, which is foundation. We've got to have the foundation and the understanding and the knowledge of the word of God so we will not be shaken in times of shaking. Okay, in remembering this session, we'll go over uh, just the points that were made. Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem. He was raised in Galilee, and he became a carpenter. He spent three years ministering to thousands and, and proving that he was the Christ. And then he was condemned to the cross to bear the penalty of our sins. And after three days, Jesus rose bodily from the dead. His resurrection is a historical reality. So as well as studying the Bible, you might want to study some history. And, um, and that helps also to build foundation in us. So I would encourage that too. I would definitely encourage you to go over the scriptures we went over today. Um, these are, this is the scripture. This is the message of the gospel of good news. This is the message that Jesus wants us to go and preach. So we have to know it in order to do that. Okay, so I'm going to close right now. If you're enjoying the classes or getting anything out of them, please share them with your friends. Uh, Share it with somebody who doesn't know the Lord. Maybe they need to come to know the Lord. Maybe they need a little bit of understanding in order to do that. But um, I encourage you to share the videos uh, if you feel led to. And also encourage you to subscribe to the channel and continue to listen to the messages and go along with me and study every week and... Uh, and let's get strong in God. Let's stand up and strengthen God and not be shaken by every little thing or, you know, something goes wrong and, and we lose faith and then we're in fear or we're anxious or uh, we're all upset, you know, and we've lost our faith all of a sudden. Because why? Because we don't have foundation. So we've got to have that. And that's the whole purpose in these classes, not to make them real long and drawn out, to keep them short. People are busy today. I definitely understand that, but um, I just want to say God bless you today. God bless you this week, and I pray with everything within my heart. Chuck and I both pray that the Word of God will be indwelt in you, ever firm to stand, that you will never be shaken in the wind, but you will be a strong and that you, you will grow and mature to be strong. This is just a little portion of your training. Holy Spirit is your teacher. We need the word of the God with the word of God, and we need Holy Spirit shedding the light, sh revelation upon that word. All right, and saying that I'm gonna say have a good week. God bless you each and every one.